If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Proverbs. And good morning, everybody. I was going to go through some announcements real quick, too, for those who, who weren't here this morning, uh, who are not here currently, but they're watching online. Uh, we're not going to have our Wednesday night this week, but Sunday, 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 one week from today, we are having both our morning service and a Sunday night dinner at 6 p.m. We are going to discuss all that's going on in Egypt for the, the church, the missionary endeavors, and we're going to try our hand to cook an Egyptian food. So bring your best Egyptian dish or bring your best open mind to Egyptian food because we're going to have a great time. We really are going to have fun. I'm going to ask anyone who's coming to dress in your best Egyptian wear. No, I'm kidding. Unless you can think of something, let's do it. If you are not here in person, you missed the church trying to walk like an Egyptian today. Going back into like the 80s throwback, it was really, really fun. Maybe we'll edit that so we don't tell everybody on the line that we did that. We had a great time this morning. We're so glad you're here today. We're so glad you're joining us, whether in person or online. And we want to specifically say if you haven't been here in person, or if you haven't been here in person in a while, now's the time to come join us. Come worship with us. Come see what God's doing in our presence. Come be a part of it. Bring your gifts, bring your talents, bring your experience, and, and come on in and let's all lift each other up and worship together. Amen? Amen. So if you have your Bibles, we're in Proverbs chapter 15. And we'll start by just reading Proverbs 15. 33 through 16, 5. Bear with me, I have to get there as well. Proverbs 15, 33 through 16, 5. The fear of the Lord is the instruction for wisdom, and before honor comes humility. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are clean in his own sight. But the Lord weighs the motives. Commit your work to the Lord, and your plans will be established. The Lord has made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. Everyone who is proud in his heart is an abomination to the Lord. Assuredly, he will not be unpunished. Our passage tells us in the very beginning of it, the fear of the Lord is the instruction for wisdom. And before honor comes humility. I love that word honor in the Hebrew. It's used more for glory than honor. And a lot of times when God was speaking the glory of the Lord, the glorious day, these statements, it's that same word. Before glory, before honor, before final reward, in essence, comes humility. So what does it mean to be humble? That would be my question for New Hope. My question for each of us individually, if I was teaching a class, I would say, hey, write down 10 ideas for what it means to be humble. I love to write a list. Matter of fact, joking around this weekend, I told the kids, you got to make a Christmas list. I love lists. And if we were to write down a list, what would humble mean to you another thing that i really love i love movies anybody else love movies and over the summer some of my family had this idea that we're going to catch up on the marvel movies in order watching them all in order now one thing i really love is iron man i love the whole character i love all the things about how he was played and and one of the things i really always enjoyed about the character iron man is there was no humility here. For a good bit of the time, it was the opposite of humility. Like when we think of humble, we don't think of bravado. We, we, we don't think of these huge, huge action people. A lot of times when we think of humble, we think of the complete opposite, right? We may even think of lowly. We may think of, of weakness, of, of almost shame like we think of humble as weak and that's really not what it's getting at either and so I thought so what what would be a good definition of of humble or of humility and I thought why don't I look online I could find definitions used to would have to go and get out a Webster's dictionary to look up 
a, def, a definition of a word. Matter of fact, in my office, I still have an actual dictionary. But if you look online, you come across several ideas. And here's a few of the definitions I found for humble. Having or showing a low or a modest estimate of one's own importance. So humility means that I, I'll think of myself as low. I think of myself as unimportant. Also, a definition of humility is a low social, political, or administrative rank. That if I'm humble, that means I, I don't count for much politically, or I don't count for much, much rank. Another version, another definition of, of humility is low in dignity or low in purpose. That's, that's what it means to be humble. Lack of dignity, lack of purpose. Our scripture tells us that humility comes before honor. It tells us that the fear of the Lord is the instruction for wisdom, and that humility comes before honor. Then it goes on to say that everyone who is proud in his heart is what? An abomination before the Lord. Assuredly, he, the proud, will not go unpunished. The theme of Proverbs, the theme of this, the fear of the Lord, is that there must be a submissive reverence for the Lord. And I will tell you a theme of Scripture, one of the biggest themes in Scripture from Genesis all the way through Revelation, is that God opposes the proud. And this is supposed to be like the closing of the message I'm giving to you early. But one of the biggest themes in all of Scripture is that God always opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's the theme of the Bible. As a fact, like the biggest theme in Scripture is pride, not good, God opposes it. The humble, God covers in grace. Matter of fact, Bible tells us that you can't have grace without humility. So if you love to take notes, I used to say if you like to take notes, but I'm going to elevate that one today. If you love to take notes, write this down for me. I can either be for God or I can be for me. That's it. We're going to wrap this up. That's it. That is the, the whole theme of Scripture. That is the theme of today's message. That is the theme of what he's getting at here in Proverbs. That I can either be for God or I can be for me. That, are the, that is the only two choices according to Scripture. Only two choices according to life. If you're over a day old, it's the only two script two things you've seen in your life, right? It could be for me or it could be for God. It could be for me or it can be for God. That's my choice. And good news, you do have a choice. You have a choice. Adam and Eve had a choice. Obey God. Stay away from that fruit. Or disobey God and take the fruit. The devil had a choice. Submit to God or make it about me and be prideful and fall. You have a choice. Submit to God. Obey God. Be for God. Be on team God to modernize it. Or be all about me. That is the choice. We only have one choice. Are we going to submit to God or is it going to be about us? So if we're taking that look, taking an idea of what is biblical humility? One, it's submission. It's not groveling. It's not looking at myself as, as I no longer have value. As a matter of fact, the Bible teaches that you have extreme value. Like you have so much value that Jesus came here to die for you type of value. So it's not hating myself. It's not despising myself. It's choosing to set a specific order to life. God first. Biblical humility is God first. By the way, this is kind of the secret to life. Is the whole living for God or living for me. And it begins with, I gotta put God first. I gotta put things in order, and I'm going to submit to some someone bigger than me. And I'm gonna to submit 
to someone whose love is unfathomable, and I'm going to submit to someone who has an understanding I'll never rise to. I'm going to submit to God, number one. Number two, on what biblical submission is, it doesn't mean being passive or silent. If we're not careful, we can look at and meekness is weakness, and we can come to this idea that, that I'm not supposed to speak up. I'm not supposed to take a stand. I'm not supposed to, to have a voice. Well, as a matter of fact, Paul called us to be zealots for God, absolute on-fire zealots for Christ, be on fire when it comes to loving others, to take a stand no matter what it costs me on what is right or what is wrong. We're to be absolute zealous for the things of God as Jesus was. Do you guys remember when you're reading Scripture, when Jesus saw them selling things in the temple, when they were, that they took the sacrificial aspect of sacrifice and threw it out the door and said, we can make a profit here. We can absolutely make a profit here. You could, you could just come in, don't even think about what you're sacrificing. God, don't even think about God when it comes to sacrifice. Let's leave him all out of there. Just come in, give us a couple pennies, take a pigeon, and here you go. Your sacrifice is done. It, it took... The offering aspect, that the heartfelt, I'm giving, I'm, I'm choosing to hurt a little. I'm choosing to sacrifice a little for, for someone bigger than me because I am offering and loving and submitting to God. It took all of that out and said, here's your token offering. And let's be careful we don't do that with our offerings. Let's be careful we don't, we don't take the beauty out of it, the sacrifice out of it. But Jesus, seeing this year after year after year, went in, and he went in multiple times, by the way, and did this. He sat down, he made a rope, so it took a little bit of time, and then he chased them out and overturned the tables because he was zealous for his father. He was on fire for holiness. So I can only stand so much. Being humble means God comes first. We're to be humble before God. We are to set things in order properly. We are to say God comes first. Another aspect of what it looks like in the Bible to be humble is that we use our talents and our resources for others. We use them for others. can't be all about me. I can't be number one in this. I've got to use these things for others. I've got to love on others. I've got to give to others. I've got to get up and sing if I'm a good singer for others to lead them in worship. I need to get up and speak if I'm a good speaker. If God's telling me to go cut so-and-so's grass, go cut the grass. Whatever it is, whatever God has blessed me with, He did so in a community, not individual. God blessed you for others. Right? Whatever your best thing is, if it's however you love others, get out there and do it. Because that is a part of being humble. Remember, we can live our lives for God. Or we can live our lives for us. That is absolutely it. Matter of fact, if you'll flip over with me to Luke... Flip over to Luke chapter 4. As we're looking at humble, Luke chapter 4. We're going to read 1 through 13. And so Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. He returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days. Tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended, he became hungry, right? He, he became very hungry after 40 days of fasting. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell the stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. 
And he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I will give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall all be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall, not, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then he led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. After the devil had tempted him, he left him. We're talking about humility today. And if we look at, at Jesus and on humbling himself, if we look at what's going on here, the temptation between God's way and my way is so revealed here. First, first after he's really, really hungry, the devil's like, eat. Make these stones, do a little miracle, eat, provide for yourself here. The devil came to the point of his physical pain and said, you know what? You shouldn't be hurting. You should eat. You, you want this, go get it. You desire this, chase after it. Nothing wrong with you meeting your own needs, right? But this was not the time that God, that the Father had for him to do that. And then number two, the devil was like, you know what? You should put yourself over others. The whole world could be worshiping you right now. You could have all the fame right now. Absolutely you could. You should chase after it. What's wrong with, with you using all of your ability for you? And then finally, the devil's like, jump off of the top of the temple so all the religious people know right now, right now, who you are. Just jump off of it. They'll have to catch you. Everybody will be amazed. They will invent CNN right now and put it on the headlines if you do this. The temptation was there. But this wasn't the Father's way. This wasn't God's way. This wasn't the way that the plan had been laid out. You could be wealthy, you could be popular, your stomach could be full right now. You don't need to go to the cross. You don't need to go through all the struggle. You don't need to humble yourself. You're God. Why in the world would God be humble? He chose humility for you. And for me, remember, He was in heaven. Eternal forever before. Left heaven for a manger. Left glory for humanity left eternity to walk on dirt roads and to be hungry and to be without a home most of his life and to die for us. He went to the cross because of how much he loved us. And he showed us how to live our lives for God. He showed us how to be humble. And remember, verse 33 tells us again that before honor comes humility. Before glory, humility. Before splendor, humility. One must be humble. Can anybody relate to this statement I'm about to make here? My best days have always come after my most humble events. Like usually it's something that hit me so hard and so painful and so humbling or my failure was so extreme or I missed the mark that bad. And then it's when I had a great day. Then it's when I became who I should be. Anybody else relate to this or am I crazy? It's like after my worst days, my great days, it seems like Scripture is true that, that honor comes after you get humbled, after you really get hurt, after you step aside and realize, you know what, I'm not all that great. I'm not all that perfect. I actually have a bunch of failures. I actually have a bunch of mistakes. You know what? Sin is not only a bad word, it's a word that applies to me. 
Right, I did it. I was there. I failed. And after that, things seem to work out. You guys know the story of Peter. He's got some great stories. And my favorite story of Peter is this guy who denied Jesus three times. Why do I love that about him? Because I probably would have been there. I probably would have been that guy. I know me. And I am really brave and I am really strong until there's a guy with a sword. And at that point, I seem to not be nearly as brave or as strong if I know me. If I think I'm going to get in trouble, if I think that that I'm going to be arrested and all those things. Peter saw Jesus arrested. And in that very moment, he was brave and strong. But then after he had time to think about it, he found himself afraid of a little girl. A little girl, I love that they put her in the the story that she really was the one that said aren't you aren't you one of his followers and he's like oh no 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 listen 11 year old child i am not i'm going to lie to you that was peter he absolutely denied jesus i've seen a lot of catchy little signs for churches i've never seen one that brags about the moment we denied jesus like we seem to think Denying Jesus is like really bad, right? If you were to put up, you know, what should you and should you not do, if you were to make a list of pros and cons, I would hope denying Jesus is on the cons side of the list. Peter did that. At some point, the Catholic Church named him Saint Peter. Peter did that. He absolutely denied Jesus. And then afterwards, after his friends came to him and said that he's rose from the dead. Peter said it still won't be the same. Like he knew his failure, right? He knew how far off he had gone. He knew how bad he was. He was humbled. And then Jesus restored him. And I'll tell you, I've had moments in my life as a person. I know I'm up here as a pastor, but I've had moments where I have absolutely, positively failed bad. And it humbled me. And after that, you see God's love. And after that, when you realize that, you know what? Grace applied for me. Grace applies to me. See, humbleness, according to Scripture, for you and for me, is submission. That's what it is. Submitting to God. Submitting to God's purpose. Submitting to God's love. Submitting to God's grace. Submitting to all the great things God has for us. Remember I said you can live for you or you can live for God? First Peter teaches us, and this is what it gets so interesting, First Peter tells us that God opposes the proud, but shows grace or shows favor to the humble. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble, shows grace to the humble. Again, that was, that was the point I was telling you I was saving for the last, but I gave it to you early. It's that grace is for the humble, Daniel, why should I live this way? Why should I be humble? Why should I live in humility? Why should I take a look at my life and say, you know what, God, you're right. I don't line up to all of your precepts. You know what, God, you're right. I can't do this for myself. You know what, God, you're right. And the fact that there's things that you say and those things may not be everything I want to do, but I'm going to submit to your way because I'm trusting in you more than me. Why should I do that? Because then and only then does grace apply to you. But God seems to say right here that there is grace for those who are humble. For those who say, I'm going to do it my way because that's just what I want to do. No problem. The Bible says God opposes which means I can either be on God's team or I can be against God because that's the choice. And if you do that, you can have God's favor or you can have God's opposition in your life. Man, if 
That's a, a title for a sermon. That's a great one. You can either have God's favor in your life or you can have God's opposition in your life. And it all comes down to that question. Are you on team you or are you on team God? That's our options. That is what we have here. Remember, if you go and you look through the New Testament, or if you're like me and you go and you watch The Chosen, I love it. Love this show. I really do. It's a great show. But one thing you're going to see repeatedly reading the New Testament, reading the stories, watching the chosen, watching things about Jesus and the disciples, he repeatedly has a saying for each one of those, for all the people he met. He has a simple saying, four words, come and follow me. Give me two words, follow me. He doesn't just say, hey, sign up. I've got this little sheet here. Go ahead and sign up. Write your name down. Like we do that when we're trying to you know, get permission to be on a ballot to be president. I think you need like 40,000 people to sign it or something in each state. Or if you're wanting to run for an office, if you're wanting to, to come up with some type of petition or another, it's just sign your name. He doesn't ask for sign-ups. He doesn't ask for membership. He doesn't ask for donations. It's too important for that. It's way too important for that. So what he asks for and what he demands solely is follow me. Walk away from you. Follow me. You get to be a part of what I'm doing, not I'm going to be a part of what you're doing. Come and follow me. The entire Bible is about this. Following Jesus, he says, I am the way. Not we are the way, not you are the way, not we are the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except what? Except by me, except through me. So pride, my way, doing it how I want to do it, creating my own understanding of faith, doing things by my wants and my hopes and my, my little things. Guys, write that down as I am the anti-salvation. I am the anti, anti-Christ. Anti-Christ. Don't write Daniel as the anti-Christ. Write me, I am the anti-Christ. Now, what do I mean when I say that? Because you can either, either be saved by Christ or you can be lost by you. That is a choice. I can live for Christ or I can die for me. I can submit to Christ or I am the anti-Christ because it's His way or my way. I can live for God or I can live for me. You can have pride. You can be proud of who you are. You can put all of your eggs in your basket, have it your way, and you gain God's opposition. Or you can be humble. You can do it God's way. You can put all of your eggs in Jesus and you can have God's grace. That's it. No one came to Jesus without humility. Nobody sitting here came to Jesus without recognizing their sin. This is why it's so important to God. Humility means so much to God because it's the only way to recognize who you are and recognize who He is. It's the only way to get His grace. Proverbs, as we've been going through Proverbs, it teaches us that pride, on the other hand, leads to failure and it leads to destruction. That's what you get when you don't come to God, when you don't come to Jesus, when you don't humble yourselves, you get failure and you get destruction. As I mentioned, pride led the devil to the first sin. Pride led Adam and Eve to choosing to eat the fruit. Pride is what led Saul to failure and to lose his kingship. Pride is what led me 
to sin. Pride is what led you to sin. Pride is what Jesus came to fight. Humility led Jesus to the cross. And humility led each of us who believe to the cross of Jesus Christ. That's why humility leads to honor because of speaking of the glory of God. And humility will lead you to the cross of Jesus. So as I was preparing this message, I thought, well, how? How do we, in essence, humble ourselves? How do we do that? Number one, the easiest, biggest, most important way to humble yourself is to look at yourself and admit, I'm not perfect. Admit, I have sinned. Admit, I have failed. Admit, I do not always line up to God. Admit, I cannot do this on my own. Literally saying, you know what, I am admitting that I just may not know it all. That's hard for me, right? That's hard for some of us. Don't agree that it's hard for Daniel. Agree it's hard for you. (laughs) But admitting the fact that Jesus has a way, and Jesus is the way, and God has a standard, and Jesus is the one who meets that standard. I must admit my sin. Really admit it. Look at what you've done. Look at who you are. Look at, at your love of self admitting that maybe, possibly, absolutely, I've got things skewed. And it's me first, God second, and i got to flip that. That's the first step to how you live a humble life. The second step to how you live a humble life is say yes to obedience. You won't see that on a bracelet anywhere, on a t-shirt or anything like that, but say yes to obedience. Get excited about obedience. There is no greater freedom than submission. How is that even possible? Does that even make sense? Let me try to explain that. Nothing is as claustrophobic-inducing than doing it your own way because you keep failing. You keep missing the mark and you know it and you you keep tied up in the bonds of shame and you keep locked in as a prisoner to guilt and you're absolutely controlled by that which you think you control right why is it sin is addictive because it controls you why is it that things like drugs and all these things are absolutely addictive because they control you Submitting to God is the only place that you will find freedom. Submitting to God is the only place where you actually feel like you get to live and you can breathe because you're suddenly free from the bondage of sin. There's a reason they continually called it, in essence, slavery. Because it controls you. It owns you. The devil didn't try to convince people to be free. The devil tried to convince people to be controlled and owned and slaves and in bondage. Say yes to freedom, which is by saying yes to obeying God. Number three, to be humble, pray. The Bible says, if my people who are called by my name, not just Jews, Christians, you If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Ooh, check out the last part of this. I will hear them and then I will heal their land. Okay, Americans, let's get on board with this. If my people who are called by my name, Christians in the United States, if we'll humble ourselves, and we will call out to God, and we will pray. He promises to hear that prayer and then to heal our land. It's hard to be self-righteous when you're praying. It really is, because it doesn't take long to realize that I am talking to a holy, mighty God who loves me and loves my neighbor that I'm angry at, right? And suddenly I get out of my own way. It doesn't take long. It goes from I want all this to I want your will in my life. 
And then be gentle. Step four is be gentle. Loving and seeing other people. And you know what? Loving and seeing yourself. Be gentle with yourself. Be gentle with others. See that they probably are also having a hard day. See that they probably also have things that they're afraid of. See that they probably also woke up with a knee that hurt today. Be gentle. Be gentle with others. Show empathy. Love others like you love yourself. I love how we're told to love others like ourselves. Like, how do I love myself? Well, I'm hungry, and I'm going to have a donut or something, right? And I'm going to love other people where somebody else is hungry. If my next-door neighbor is hungry, I can get a second donut, right? Love others where you don't love just yourself, but where you're caring for and doing for others. And then finally, let go of your need for prestige, which means let go of that desire for it to all be about you. Let go of that desire to be right all the time. That takes us all the way back to our first, very most important point. All of Scripture. You can live your life for you, or you can live your life for God. You can be on team you, or you can be on team God. John 2, 16 to 17. First John, I'm sorry. 2, 16 to 17 says, Do not love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Do not love the world and the ways of the world. Whoever does love the world is not from God. The love of the Father is not in that person. As we close, we'll say our last point one more time. You can live for God, or you can live for you. You have a choice, and those are your choices. And so you can be in opposition to God, or you can be in the grace of God. You have a choice, and those are your choices. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, thank you for ripping the veil, letting us see the truth. Let us see the glory of God, the depravity of man. Thank you for letting us see that there really are two simple choices. You or me. You're in charge or I'm. You get the glory or I get the glory. I can live my life for you or I can live my life for me. God, we don't want to be in opposition to you. Instead, we want to be in grace, the midst of, of your love, the midst of your goodness. So God, teach us how to seek your face. And God, we come before you also as your people, humbling ourselves and just praying for our land, asking for a touch of revival. God, may it start here in our heart. May we be the first to chase after you and believe God. You and only you, God. May we be our neighbor ask for you to start revival in each of our hearts individually. And God, may it spread from there. Whether it's a wildfire or spark, God, change our hearts. Humble us, holy us, make us more like you. Amen. We look forward to seeing you Sunday morning and Sunday night next week.